you have your Bibles, Acts chapter 11. We're going to Acts chapter 11. I love the book of Acts. Some great things are happening here, so let's just jump right in. Acts 11, uh, beginning in verse 19. We're going to have it on the screen here for you here in the room, and uh, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, whatever you're reading the Scriptures in, it'll be Acts chapter 11, verse 19, through the remainder of the chapter. It says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of the One of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, every one according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. I'm going to focus on that first part of this passage today, really primarily verses 19 through 26. And, and just as, as you know, uh, our church has, has existed for quite some time. This past few weeks, our church leadership team, our staff has come together. We have met really to, to look at some of those basic questions of why do we exist? You know, it, it seems like a very simple question, one that shouldn't be changing, but there are times in the life of a church we need to ask the questions again. We need to be reminded of why we do what we do, of, of, of how we do those things, how we fulfill what God has called us to do. We need to understand, at least more fully, at least as a church family, that to make sure that we're all on the same page. I work with a number of church planters. In fact, I, uh, I just finished up this uh, last week with six church planter, planters here in Jacksonville, and uh, we were taking them through uh, 11 weeks of training as a cohort, and it takes about 20 weeks or 22 weeks to get through this, and we meet and we go through this material, and these, these new pastors are, are going through leadership development and, and reevaluating their call to the ministry and, and answering the questions of why does a church need to be where God is leading them to plant a church, and how are they going to fund that, and how are they going to live, and how are they going to pay the bills, and all those detailed questions. And one of the things that we do is we go through something called a vision framing, a vision frame. It, it, it really is just simply asking the question, why? Does your church exist? What makes your church unique? Now, there is a gospel that is never changing and is always the same, and there are certain things about church that are pretty, shouldn't be unique, should be across the board with all churches, but there are also some very unique things that make a church like First Baptist Orange Park a bit different from a church down the street. Good churches, both preaching the gospel, but there's something unique about where we are and who we are. So you have to ask that question, why do you do what you do? And then the answer to that, or wherever you develop that, is built on the values that you deemed and you hold through Scripture to be those which drive you. And then you have to go to this point of, well, how do you do this? How do we do X, Y, and Z? How do we do whatever is necessary to fulfill that calling God has given us here? And then there's that last aspect, which is most often ignored or forgotten by many pastors and church leaders, especially over time. And it's the evaluation aspect of are we, if we're going to say, hey, we want to make disciples, then the ultimate question is, how do you know when you've done it? How do you know when you've made a disciple? What does a disciple look like? How do you know you fulfilled the task you've already determined to be very important? And so the evaluation aspect is essential, and, and, I, and I get it because I've heard a lot of pushback from some saying, well, you know, it's hard to, hard to evaluate like the Holy Spirit and all of that. And Well, you really don't. You're not evaluating God. But just because something is hard to measure doesn't mean you shouldn't try to measure it. Just because something is challenging doesn't mean you ignore it. For when you start ignoring the measuring, you find yourself at a point where you're just sustaining the gathering by calling it success when there are people with a pulse in the room. And you may not actually be fulfilling the calling God has given you. And so we revisit a number of these things, but here's something about the, the answering of these questions, the revisiting for us. It is a very freeing thing. 
It allows us to understand there are things that we say no to. There are things that church members and others in the community just per perceive and think that it's the responsibility of the church to do. And so they'll say, well, you're a church. You're supposed to do X, Y, and Z. But if you have in your understanding as a church very clearly, biblically founded why you do what you do and the how you do what you do, then sometimes those things that come from many with experiences or opinions and determination of what a Christian or a church ought to do, you have the freedom to say, well, that's a good idea, but no, we don't do that. Uh, the YMCA does that, or this other church does that, or this other organization does that. It's not bad, it's just not what we do. So every time we say no to something, it means we have a stronger and deeper yes behind it. Because if we're going to do everything, we'll find ourselves probably doing very little well. So we need to understand who we are and why we do what we do. And it's really exciting for a new church plant to be able to start that way because if you're a church planter and you've got 12 guys and ladies that are coming in saying, we want to help you start this new ministry, many of them are coming from other churches, they have histories, they have backgrounds, they have experiences, and that is a benefit. But sometimes they'll come in with expectations and say, well, I think we ought to do that. And if the church plant has already dis determined what their unique giftedness is and where they're going, then that planter has the freedom to say, that's a great idea, but no. That's not what we do. We don't have the finances, the resources, the people, or the, that's not who we are. And it really is freeing. We at First Baptist Orange Park are classified a legacy church. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. It's a fairly new term, legacy church. Someone asked me, one of the church planters and new pastors said, hey, what, what is a legacy church? I said, it's a nice way to say we're an old church. It's to the equivalent of all the churches that had senior adult ministries and all of a sudden had seasoned adult ministries. It's just a different way to say the same thing. I'm not really a fan of seasoned adult ministry. It just sounds like you taste really good. I'm not quite sure what that means. We are what we are, but legacy church, it just sounds so much better than you've been around a while. But the challenge on a legacy church is this. With 99 years of history, there's a whole lot of opinions of what we ought to do. Here's the challenge that I believe we have to really come to grips with. If we were to interview every church member individually in the church today online in the 8 o'clock service, wherever, just ask you, hey, in like three sentences, explain who we are and what our priority is. I believe they would have a lot of great answers, but I also believe they'd be all over the place. Everybody would look at it based on their own perspective and their own set of lenses based on what they expect the church to be and to do. And the church might say, well, that's a great idea, but we really don't do that. That's not who we are. That's who we were but that's not who we are. If we're not careful, if you're not careful, legacy churches will find themselves continuing to program and continuing to plan just as they did decades prior, really positioned well to reach a people group that no longer exists. Back in January and February, I told our staff, I said, uh, you know, we, I don't know if you've ever been in our conference room back here in our offices, but we have this, this whiteboard calendar. It's about, I don't know, eight feet wide, four feet tall. It's huge. It's a whole year at a glance. It seemed like such a good idea when we bought it. And it really is, because if you need to say, hey, where are we going, what are we doing, you're kind of looking at this. But there's also something, and I, I lamented, I, I lamented. Lamented is a biblical way of saying, I was whining to the staff and just saying, you know, if you look at this calendar, it is packed. We have a fine point dry erase marker just to write on it because there's so much stuff on it. And in one end, you, you, in one end, you could say, man, that just tells you how much ministry we're doing. Maybe, but on the other end, you could be saying, that's just us making everybody busy. And, and if you're overly busy, it'll eliminate ministry, but you'll feel like you're doing something. So ask the right questions, get the right answers. Reggie McNeil, church leader, years ago wrote a book called The Present Future. Some of our deacons and leaders have read that. And the subcontext of that book was this. It was saying that churches, by and large, are answering the questions, the important, qu or, or a set of questions correctly. The problem is they're answering the wrong questions. And if we're not careful, this is, a, this is just something that churches have done. We've, we, we're, we're guilty of this as well. When things get put on a calendar, when things get put in a budget, when things get put on a schedule, it is a really great idea initially, but it is super, super hard eventually to get it off of there, even if that version of ministry no longer is effective. And so that's what happens with our calendars when they get overwhelmed. 
Now, I do not think this is why God did what he did, but think this is one you know, silver lining of, the, of what happened in March. Our calendar was erased. We didn't erase it, but it was erased for us. And what we had to do is we had to ask the very hard questions. What must we do if we can only do a few things? We can't do everything, and everybody's favorite ministry is not going to happen the way it used to, but what must we do to be the church that God has placed us here to be, preparing us for this time? I read in the book of Acts, and I see it played out here, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm just encouraged by this because I do believe, I do believe what we see in the book of Acts is not a precursor to what God expects of his church today, but is actually a model that he expects us to continue without an upgrade, without a major shift, without a new and improved doctrine. While practice and context means that no two churches are the same, and we are likely not organized like the church at Antioch, the underlying reason of why that church exists remains the same. Glorify God and worship together and to reach the world. I mean, that's an overly simplified area, but maybe it is more simple than we think. That's who we're to be. And so as we look at this and this practice and this context, meaning no churches are going to be exactly alike, that no churches will have identical gatherings. We, we're having a missions conference. It's streaming on Tuesday at 2. I hope you're online or at least can share that with your friends. Uh, Kenzie Allen and I are meeting with John Robinson. We've already recorded it all. And it is an update and an information uh, presentation of the mission work we're doing in Europe today. And you'll see clips on there of some of our brothers and our, and our pastor friends that are meeting in, in, around tables in their homes in the Basque country, having worship in a language that I cannot speak and you likely have never heard. Their church service looks much different than this. Their gospel's the same. The, the ultimate planning and the ultimate or, 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 or template that they build on is identical because we see it in the book of Acts. So, so let, me, let me just kind of walk you through some things that God has led us to to make sure that if you're asked what our values are as a church and why we do what we do, at least, at least maybe soon we'll all be given the same answer. So if you like points, here's a bullet point for you. The first thing is we exist and we do what we do because we love God. Now, I know we're a church that doesn't like to talk back to the preacher. I get that. It scares me when anybody starts amening because it's so out of character. But it does remind me that maybe you're still awake. So we're going to do a little, little feedback today. And um, I want you to repeat after me. Love God. Let's try it again. That, that's, that's okay. It's proof we don't do this much. This is our responsive reading for the day. We exist to love God. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? Love God. It sounds like so many people could do this. But here, here's the question to ask when you look at what's happening in the early church. Why would people in this city of Antioch and other surrounding cities, why would they, in, in, in this region around the Mediterranean, in Jewish, Roman, Greek, and other, other cultures, abandon the religion of their family? Now think about this. They abandoned grandma's church. They abandoned the religion of their parents. They abandoned the religion of their employers at risk of losing their job. They abandoned the religion of their siblings, so Thanksgiving would have been real fun. They left all of that and surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Why would anybody abandon their whole heritage of religion and what's expected and what's supposed to happen to join something that had yet to exist, and that is this new church? Here's another question. Why are these churches being placed and planted in these cities like Antioch that are known to be regions that don't want churches? That are known to be places where persecution is happening. Where Christians, will, will some have lost their lives already. Others will. Why would anybody intentionally join a church knowing that it's not celebrated in the community? It's not going to get you more clients for your business. It's going to lose them. It's not going to get you invited to the right parties. You won't be invited to anything. Why do this? Why would people choose to consider themselves as family members with those prior to becoming Christians, with those that they despised otherwise? Jews and Gentiles? Why in the world would this ever occur? And the answer is it can't occur under the world's viewpoint. These people abandon everything. I don't, I think we, I don't even think we think about that much. I think we see church historically like it is today, where you move to a town, you find a church that offers something you want, the schedule works, the people are nice, I'm going to attend, I give it an hour, once an hour every month maybe, I don't know, and that's it. 
That's not this. This is forsaking all. I, I trust him. I go in. I'm all in. As John the Apostle wrote in his letter, 1 John, he gives us a reminder that the capacity to love God is not something we have within us. So when I say that we do what we do because we love God, that's not easy, that's not simple, and that is not manufactured by a human being. In fact, the capacity to love other people isn't actually within us either. The capacity to love as God would love begins with God, not us. You say, well, lost people love. They don't love like that. They can't. It's not in them. They have no idea. They're selfish loving. They, they, They love for themselves. They don't love for others. They don't love God because of who he is. They might say they love God hoping he works for them. That's not love. We love God, as John wrote in 1 John 4, 19, because he first loved us. See, prior to him, us even knowing he existed, he loved us. Everly, Lawson, the Hoffman boys, all these little babies and children that were dedicated today are loved by God more than their parents loved them are loved by God, oh, this is hard, I'm going to say it, more than their grandparents love them. And were loved before they were even conceived. Let that sink in because that's the reality of what we're looking at. As the early church did, so must we. Our love for God motivates us to seek to glorify Him in all of our lives. Meaning this, the way we talk and the things we say, our thoughts, our motives, our online postings, the way we act, our impact in the lives of other people is not something we do to make God love us more or like us more. It is something we do because our deeds matter, but they flow from the love we have for Him and the love that He has for us first. We act a certain way because of God, not to manipulate God. There are a lot of folks that think, well, if I just do more good deeds, I'll get to heaven. Good deeds won't get you into, into heaven. A new heart will, a new life will, a transformed life will. And because of God's love for us, we have this amazing capacity to love him right back. I know some people struggle with that. They don't love God the way they're supposed to because Maybe their earthly father was such a terrible, terrible model. They have a really hard in, uh, challenge of loving a heavenly father. I, I, I say I get that. I get that. I, not personally, but I do get that. I understand that. It's really hard because people transfer that over. But God's love for us motivates us. So why do we do what we do? Because we love God. That ought to be our answer when someone asks, hey, why does your church do that? Because we love God. Why do you guys feed all those people? Why did all that food come? Because we love God. Why do you do those events? Because we love God. Why do you open your building up for the schools to do concerts? Well, we, we love God. And they're going to go, that makes no sense. And we're going to go, that's right. And it won't make sense until you love God. Hmm. We do what we do because we love God. Second thing, oh, by the way, repeat after me, love God. Love God. Man, I always hate going to churches where the preacher makes them do that. Second thing is, Remember those t-shirts we used to have, say, love God, love people, make disciples? Makes for a cool t-shirt, but only if if it's true. And so, based on the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, I mean, we get that. We do love God, which leads us, it has to start with loving God, which leads us to loving, and I've changed it just a bit, just to make sure we get this. Love all people. Can you repeat that for me? Love all people. See, by saying it, you're sticking it in your head. It's there somewhere now. Love God, love all people. Now, that little word all is the, the, ooh, ooh, ooh. I'd rather you just say love people. Yeah, I know you would. But we're saying love all people. What does that mean? It means the people that I don't want to love. Look at verse 20. There were some of them, the men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who were on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So, so let me just share this with you. I'm going to get to it in a couple weeks, but I'm going to jump ahead. It was last Thursday, I was talking to our church planners, and we looked at this passage, and I said, look, look at Acts 13, verses 1 through 3. It's not on the screen, so just listen. It's the same city, same church. Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas are the same guys. They show up in 11, they're sent out in 13. There's like a year in between chapter 11 and 13, okay? So it's not like just five minutes later. In chapter 13, first few verses, it says, There were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, we already talked about him, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, 
Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands upon them, and they sent them off. So, so here's my point. I want to look at this part today. In verse 20, it says, There were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene. So Cyprus and Cyrene are these little island nations, right, in the middle of the Mediterranean. And people who, like, do mapping and cartography, and they start categorizing what continent this goes to and that goes to, uh, I actually would have thought, well, that's probably more Europe and if you want to go Middle East, then that would be Asia. But most are putting them in Africa. So you got these people, unnamed at this point, who show up in Antioch, who love Jesus, and are from Cyprus and Cyrene. Now this is the most politically incorrect thing to do, is we're identifying people from where, by where they're from. And if you look at chapter 13, it's even more politically incorrect, but politically incorrect for the glory of God. Let me look at that again. It says in chapter 13, there's a man named Simeon, also called Niger. Now, why was Simeon also called Niger? Somebody said at 8 o'clock, because there's more than one Simeon. We figured that out pretty quickly. There's a lot of people with the same name. But he's also called Niger because that is a descriptor, most likely, of the fact that his skin tone's a little darker than some of the others. And he's from a different region. And then it says there's, of course, Simeon of Niger, and then there's Lucius of Cyrene. This is quiz time. Why do they call him Lucius of Cyrene? Thank you. You got an A because his name is Lucius and he's from Cyrene. May have been one of the other guys in the initial chapter 11. Could be. And then this guy, this, this blows me away. This is a sermon coming up. So when I do chapter 13 later, act like you didn't hear this part because this is really good. Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Who's Herod the Tetrarch? Well, he's one of the son, one of the, the, the sons of Herod the Great. You know, he kind of is leading that everybody. He hates Christians. He's a bad guy. He's not one you want to have invite over to dinner. And here's who's in the church. Manan, who grew up with Herod the Tetrarch and was in his gang as a kid and was a buddy his entire life with him. Here's your church. Why is it so politically incorrect? Because what we're doing is we're identifying people by their skin tone, where they're from, their background, their language. But we're not doing so to segregate them. We're doing that so to say, look at this. The man-made concepts of who belongs in the church are blown to pieces by what God is doing in the place where they first called people Christians. There's multiple skin tones. There's all kind of baggage. And everybody that I mentioned came with religious baggage from whatever religion they had before they became Christians, which was totally different than what they're in now. And that's what God did. He put everybody together and he said, this is my church. There's no... Uh, nobody carting them at the door and making sure, well, you're Jewish, you can come in. Or you're from this place and you can come in. This is the church in Antioch. It wasn't until years later that we started segregating and becoming a little more difficult in those regards and unbiblical. So when I look at this and I say, hey, we're to love all people. All people? Yeah, all people. Regardless of skin tone, regardless where they've come from, regardless how much money they have, all people. Regardless if they can do anything for you. Tim Keller calls the preachers that show up at, this, uh, at Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene, he calls them maverick preachers. I kind of like that. I might, might change my title. Put it on the sign out front, maverick teacher. F.F. F. Bruce calls them daring spirits. I call them models in which to follow. Their love for God led them to love all people, all people. They abandoned any man-made racial and religious divides that are so common in every culture. The black skin, brown skin, white skin, olive skin, Hebrew speaking, Greek speaking, and any other language speaking people that were in Antioch were their neighbors and they would share the gospel with them clearly. They loved people enough to share Christ with them. What's happened in the the American church, evangelicalism, Baptist, what has happened is that often we will say the right things, but our practice will show something otherwise. In fact, so often we, we, we don't ever really say this, but we live like we want our fish cleaned before we catch them. As long as you start behaving correctly, then we'll invite you into the church. As long as you change this in your life, then we'll tell, because otherwise we don't want to be hanging out with you. The gospel does not clean the fish before they're caught. The gospel is what catches and holds on and transforms. Love God. 
love all people. And thirdly, and I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly here, they loved where they lived. And I know you've heard me say this, but I think we need to just grab hold of this and use this as a, as a theme for who we are. I didn't come up with it. I was actually reading a book by Shauna Pilgrim, who is a church planter's wife. I believe she was from the South Georgia or Thomasville, Georgia area, and that's where her husband was serving. And he was called to plant a church in San Francisco. He is apparently still in San Francisco. They all are serving in the SIN Network, which is, excuse me, our North American Mission Board. And she wrote a book called Love Where You Live, and it was one of the required reading books for the church planters in my network and in our network here in Jacksonville. And I read the book, and though it might be a little more uh, important for for pastors' wives and and women, it is a, a book I would recommend everyone to read because here's the theme. I don't know if you know this, maybe you're unaware, but South Georgia and San Francisco are a bit different. And, and if I were to say that in San Francisco, they would laugh just as loudly. I mean, it's like they, these are polar opposites of locations. Things are done differently. And, 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 and what she has made very clear is as different as it is, if we don't love where we live, we will always long for somewhere else. And we see this in, you know, you, you know pastors, Southern Baptist pastors' tenure used to be averaged out to 18 months. That's how long a pastor would stay at a church. Maybe it's up to like three, three, 36 months, two or three years now. I don't know. I guess that's three years. Let me do the math. Yeah. Um, but it's still not very long. And, and there are a lot of reasons why guys are here and then they go there. Sometimes they need to. Sometimes the church is, is not. It, it, there's issues with the church. Sometimes it's issues with him. Sometimes it's financial. Who knows? But here's something else to consider. From, I'll just talk about pastors since I is one. If we're serving in a church, always longing for the next one, we will never love the church God has called us to shepherd. And if you live in a city always hoping for the cabin in Carolina, or always hoping to get the beach house, or always hoping to move away, you may never see where you are as where God has strategically placed you for his glory. And you won't love where you live. I'm not talking about the geography. There's a lot, I mean... You can love geography, but if you don't love where you live enough to stay, sometimes we just need to stay. Some people just need to go. We sent the Floros up to New York City to a place they've never lived because God would not let them get away from the calling to go. But now that they're there, guess what they're called to do? Stay. That church plant will not survive if it only lasts two years. That's a 20, 30-year plant. That isn't, oh, this cute little family is moving to New York for a few years to do something good for God. No, this family is turning Queens into home, and their grandkids will visit them in their apartment one day. That's the story. The transient lifestyles that many of us have leave us from actually maybe loving where we actually live. We need to realize that we're in Orange Park as First Baptist Church on purpose. We're not running away, and we have to love where we live. Now, I know not everybody here lives in Orange Park. Some of you live in Fleming Island, some in Oakley, some in Middleburg. You have to love where you live locally, but you also need to love where your church lives. you got to love it. It says, The hand of the Lord, verse 21, was on them or with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. We believe In the call to go, we believe in the call to stay. The Antiochians, is that a word? Okay. It is now. The Antiochians were led to Christ by some missionaries, but it it was the Christians that already lived in the city that had made that their home, that made the church. There's a story being written, while persecution remained, the love for their city, for their people, kept them telling others of the great gospel. I heard a story, I think maybe John had mentioned it or Dave had mentioned it in one of our staff meetings, and I'll probably paraphrase it and get some points wrong, but there was a young couple with children that moved to Southern California due to the work relocating them and the job they had. They ended up living in a house in this city, in this suburb, uh, that they could afford, but it was overpriced anyway. It was a tiny house. It was very bad schools. The house was like 400 grand. It was a little bitty. The schools weren't good. The pl- neighborhood wasn't a place anybody would recommend to live. It was not safe. It was not upwardly mobile. It was not the place to be, and it was just a hard location for them to be at the time, but that was where the job was. Then, apparently, the dad got a job offer from a major corporation, and the deal was this, pretty sweet deal. They were going to move their entire 
entire family to New England. And where they were going to live in New England, the houses in that housing market, very nice, a lot newer, a lot cleaner, a lot safer, and a little bit cheaper, or at least the same price you get a bigger house. Uh, the job pays more. Uh, the schools are much better. They're, they're safer, and, and they're A-rated where they're not there. And this family, look at this. This was an article. This is why it made, it, made the news, or in religion news. They said no. You know why they said no? Because of their church. Because what was happening where they were in Southern California was so impactful in their own lives that they couldn't dare walk away from it just for the sugar stick that was being offered to them. They said, you know, there's some things going on here that I don't want to walk away from. The church family in Southern California was impacting others. They were in discipleship relationships. The man was helping lead others in his church. He wasn't a pastor. She wasn't a pastor's wife. They were church members. They loved that hard place where they lived that others would just shake their head and say, I can't believe you live there. And they loved their church family and they loved what God was doing. And they loved it so much knowing that God did not tell them they were allowed to leave yet. I read that and I think, why is that news? It's news because it never happens or it hardly ever happens. Usually we would read that and go, wow, God rescued them from a bad location. But where they were, their kids were growing in their faith. They were living a little more challenging and they're, they were living there because it was for God's glory and for their good and their neighbor's good and their children's good and they could not abandon the call for the shiny new option. Sadly, I think most people would take the job and we would then ask God to bless it usually get that out of order because that's kind of what happens we pick new churches like you pick the subdivision you want to live in or the school you want your kids to go to and sometimes that's God doing it but sometimes it's I'm going to do what I want to and ask God to bless it and we got to be real honest with us with ourselves on that what would happen if, I don't know, I mean, how, what would happen if that happened here and, and, and people said, you know what, I, th these are great options, it would be better, it would be awesome, it would be wonderful, it seems good on the surface, but I can't leave First Baptist Church of Orange Park right now because God hasn't released me. That's so foreign because people leave our church all the time just to go to one down the street, much less one in another state. And vice versa, they come here for the same, I mean, it's just an American reality. Which leads us to this last part. Love God, love all people, love where you live, and love the church. It sounds self-serving, but it isn't. Look here. Barnabas, verse 25, went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he had found him, he brought him back to Antioch. For the whole year they met with the church, and they taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, I know it, and you know it. you got people that are like, man, I love God, I just don't like church. I don't like organized religion. I've heard every single excuse I don't like organized religion. I don't like church. I don't like the people that go there. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. They're just going to have a bunch of rules. I won't be able to have fun. Man, I've heard it since I did youth group work. I mean, it's the same thing. I hear it from adults and teens. We've heard it our whole life. And yeah, there are some real sorry churches out there. Just go ahead and call it what it is. There are churches that call themselves churches that I would never encourage anybody to join. And there are others. And I think what's happened, we've lost the age of the churchman and the churchwoman. It's a lost reality and consumerism overtakes it. Consumers join churches for the programs and the experiences and because the schedule fits theirs. That's why consumers join churches. But that's also why they leave churches. Because when the latest version comes out, they want to give it a shot. Same reason people get new iPhones. They want to upgrade. When people look at churches as the best option as a shopper looks for goods, consumers are who we are. Disciples, however, love the church, the local church. I know there's the universal, but there's the local. And there's something important about the local church. Otherwise, you wouldn't have all these stories in the New Testament about local churches. That just debunks everybody that just says, ignores the local church and is a member of the universal church while they never go to church. Disciples love God's church. Why? Because God loves his church. Because Jesus Christ died for the glory of the Father and for the good of his bride his church. The church matters. The local body matters. For it is in the local body of believers corporate worship occurs. Now I know some of you are worshiping at home on your couch and you're watching us as we stream this, but I long for the day you can come back together in the fellowship of believers because it's just not the same. It's not. Gathering one with another, we 
we worship corporately. It is in the local body of believers the equipping of the saints is centered in a family of believers. It is in the local church that discipline and holiness are elevated. Church discipline through a streaming service will never happen. What are we going to do? Cut your Netflix? I mean, it's not going to happen. Church discipline happens within the fellowship when we are one with another for the good of ourselves and for the glory of God. It is in the church that baptism takes place. Ricky is baptized as a part of this church. Yeah, you go, well, he could have been baptized in the backyard. Well, he could have been if we just invited the whole church to kind of gather. We've done that. We've had gatherings. But dunking yourself in the bathtub is probably not equivalent to the baptism we just experienced today. Lord's Supper takes place in the corporate uh, body. And I know people differ on this, and you'll disagree with me, and that's okay. But I'm just telling you, my conviction is the Lord's Supper with a tortilla chip and a knee-high grape at your kitchen table while you watch church on TV is not the Lord's Supper. It's not. It's a Dorito and Kool-Aid. There is something about, why is it called communion? We commune one with another as we come together as the family of God. Well, that's an individual thing. Individualism is killing the church too, by the way. The only time you see self with a hyphen in the scriptures as elevated as good is self-sacrifice. So be careful about individualizing your faith to such a degree that you abandon the corporate gathering. There are some really sorry excuses, as I said, for local churches. There are some with skewed doctrine. There are some led by pseudo-pastors who do little more than play power games while they line their pockets with the money of unsuspecting people who show up. Walk away from those. Run away and quit giving your money to them. Be careful not to lump every expression of the local body into the same category just because of some bad ones that we know of. To love God is to love all people, is to love where you live, and to love his church for his glory and your good. The believers were first called Christians in Antioch. That was not a term of endearment. It was not a compliment. It was an insult. But I love it. And I long for Orange Park and the surrounding community to insult us like that. Where they would look at us and say, that church, that First Baptist Orange Park, those people... They're just trying to be like Jesus. They're just little Jesuses. That was the insult. Little Christ. Little Christians. To which the church went, huh? You're making fun of us and calling us little Jesuses because we're trying to live like him? Yeah. Okay, we'll take it. And that became their name. May we live such a life. May we live such lives together as family that others will see Jesus in us. As we love God, we love all people. We love where we live. And we love the church. If you want a simplified statement of who we are and why we do what we do, here it is. We exist at First Baptist Orange Park to glorify God by surrendering fully to His Lordship, joining in God's work, while living as authentic, joyful believers. That's what we do. Why we do it is because we love God, love people, love where we live, and love his church. And it's good to be reminded of this. I pray that we will get to the point as a church family that if anybody in the community were to ask, what's that church about? You could answer it with that statement. Why do you do what you do? You could answer it with those statements. And we would be working together in unity for the sake of the gospel, for the glory of God, for the good of this community. If you don't know this Jesus we speak of today, you can have new life today, just like Ricky has new life now because of saying yes to Jesus Christ, just like other believers who have said yes have said yes. You can say yes to Jesus and be his child, be God's child, a co-heir with Christ. Surrender your sin, surrender your life. Let him take control. Give up. And he will, it'll be, it'll be, when you do so, you'll say, why didn't I do this earlier? If you're online and you'd like to respond to that and you'd like to talk to us, just email us at firstbaptist at opfirst.org. Firstbaptist at opfirst.org. If you're in the room when we dismiss, our pastors, leaders would love to talk to you more about that. Let's pray together.
as we go out into the mission field. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you have made us and how you've planted us here for your glory. And I pray, Father, that our statement and our values will be more than things written on a page, put on a website, or stated when people ask us questions, but they will be so evident in how we live our lives that we will not have to think twice about answering that because it will be so clear that we love you so dearly. And because of our love for you, it leads us to love all people, regardless of where they are, who they are, what they believe, what they do. To love people without affirming sin is who we are because that's who you are. And Lord, you placed us here 99 years ago in Orange Park for today, for this moment. May we not miss it, I pray in Jesus' name.